Good morning, Cosmopolitan and friends. It's good to know that you're watching us on YouTube and that we are continuing to carry out the work that God has called us to do. We ask for your prayers today. Uh, it is seemingly a very difficult uh, time for me in preparation for this message. Uh, I've uh, wrestled with it and I just pray for that that I will be obedient to the Holy Spirit and stop trying to do what Larry wants to do. So just keep me in your prayers and thank you. Now let us have a word of prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we pray that you would just speak to us through your written word. May we hear what you have to say. And we'll be ever so careful to give you the, the honor, the praise, and the glory that you so rightfully deserve. Now be in our midst and we'll forever be thankful in Jesus' name. Amen. We're coming to you out of the book of Matthews, chapter 5, and we're going to be looking at verses 13 through 16. And in these verses, we find these words. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt has lost its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out trampled out of the foot by men. You are the light of the world. A city that sitteth on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but put it on a lampstand so that it can give light to all who are in its house. Let your light shine before men so that they may see your good work and glorify your Father in heaven. There are two things that we're learning from this passage of scripture. We all know that this is part of the Sermon on the Mount that was given by Jesus in chapters 5 through 7 of the book of Matthews. And here Jesus is telling us that we are, as a church, as believers, are to be the salt of the earth. We know that salt is used to preserve, salt is used to season, to bring taste to uh, a flavoring, to something that someone is eating. And so we know also that salt has a healing power. We notice that in the Dead Sea, the saltiness of that has been mineral for many, many people over the years. And there's been a healing element that comes from that. But here, Jesus is speaking. And Jesus is saying, you are the salt of the earth. I wonder how many of us are carrying on the character of the salt. Salt brings flavoring, seasoning. Salt has a way to preserve to keep something for a period of time. Salt has a usefulness. And God is saying to us that he want us to be used by him. He want us to be salt. So when people come around us, they will know that there's something different about us. God is calling us to be salt bring flavor. But I wonder how many of us are doing what God has called us to do. How many of us are actually living up to being the salt of the earth as he wants us to be? And he says, too many of us have lost our saltness. And let me break it down and tell you what it's really saying to us. It's want us to understand that we as a church has lost our flavoring. And we are fit for nothing to be trampled upon. And that's a sad commentary on the church today. We used to have influence in the community. No matter what was going on in the community, the church was the center of it. And people would come to the church for guidance. And even those that were out in the world had a respect for the church. There were just certain things people wouldn't do around the church building because of what that church stood for. 
We had a, 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 a flavoring in the lives of even the unbelievers. But it seems as if today the church has become so liberalized that we no longer stand for anything. We allow any and everything to go on and the church stands back and say nothing. I'm not talking about us going out there beating old people over the head for sin. I'm talking about where we are demonstrating the love of God. Telling the sinner that God loves them and that God can meet them where they are and that God is one that can change their lives. I'm talking about where we are going out meeting the needs of the people in our community. And we're not just talking about poor people that are living on the streets. We have broken homes. We have broken marriages. But because the church is not standing and our marriages are all messed up, how can anybody look to us? We have lost our saltness. And we are fit for nothing but to be trampled upon to be walked upon. And as I look at the church today, I see that. I see that the church has no influence. It used to be a time that if a politician was getting ready to run for office, he was come by the church. And we know that we're not saying that they were good men and that they were godly men, but they knew that they needed the church people in order to get by. And then we had a little influence on them because we remind them, now you're going to be running for office again. And what are you going to do to better the lives of people? We're not talking about putting money in the church pocket. We can have influence in our community, in our, uh, in, 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 in our environment to bring about changes, to bring about social justice within our community to stand for right. But we're not doing it. People are just walking on us. We're fit for nothing but to be trampled upon. But it's not too late. God has want to raise up an army of people, a body of believers that truly has been transformed. Truly people that have come into a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ and realize that we need to celebrate what he did for us on Calvary. If I had to tag this text in the middle of what I'm saying right now, I would tag it. Who are we? Have we lost our identity? Are we playing so close to the world that you can't tell the difference? If someone investigated our lives, would they be able to come to the conclusion that we are children of the most high God and that we live in obedience to his will? Are we so shabby that we have no flavoring? Listen to what Jesus says one more time. He says, you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt has lost its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? When people come to you, can you give them the word of God? Can you let them know that God loves you? You know, saints, we're, we're not out here to beat people up about their sins. We're here to show them that there's one that will forgive them of their sins. We're here to demonstrate to them. Yes, we tell them what sin is. We don't dodge it. We don't run away from it. But too many times we use it as a hammer to beat people up because they're not like us. Look how long it took you to get to where you are. You ought to remember when you're talking to someone that has gone through some of the same things that you've gone through, it was a process for you to come out of it. Yes, God can bring you out of it right away. God can deliver you out of your sin right away. But the problem is that we have a tendency to want to be the judge when we should be the witness. You heard me say it. If you've been in Cosmopolitan long enough, 
You heard me say it over and over. God didn't call us to be a judge, but he called us to be a witness. So when we are salt, we will be able to tell the people that there's a God that loves them, that can save them. We'll come into a situation where there need to be some seasoning in the life of a young lady that is pregnant or a young man that is strung out on drugs or a family that is having turmoil, husband and wife fighting each other. Can you walk into that situation and bring some seasoning? Let them know that God loves them and cares enough about them. Oh, I want to just take a few moments to talk about that salt that is trampled upon, that salt that is good for nothing, but to throw it out there so the man can walk upon it. I don't want us cosmopolitan to be like that anymore. I want us to be a church that is a beacon of hope. Bring life into people. Set them free. God is an awesome God. If he delivered me, he could deliver you. And if he delivered you, he can deliver somebody else because we all were sinners. Come on, let's be salt. We don't need any, we don't need any salt that's, that doesn't have, uh, uh, I, I'm, I, I'm trying to think of the right word to put it in, but uh, we, we need salt that is salt. We need no imitation salt, substitute salt. That's what I was trying to get to see because y'all don't understand that I prepare for another message, but I've been trying to get ready for it for the last six hours. I've studied, poured into it. And God gave this to me in my spirit just a few minutes ago. And I know it's of him because I haven't had to retake it, retake. God is telling me, Larry, I need you to go out. And I need you to be salt. I need you to go into situations and bring about peace. Not because of you're somebody, but because of what you bring them. You are my salt. I give you your flavoring. Oh, help me out, Holy Ghost. Thank you. And not only are we the salt of the earth, and I'm asking us, don't lose our flavor because we, we want to be good. We don't want to be walked under by the foot of man. And so you are the light of the world. Light shine is always has and it always will. Light just shine. You are the light. Church, are we shining on 85th Avenue? Do anybody know anything about us other than that white church that's down on the corner? I'm thankful that I can say that there's some work that we've been doing in the community, that we've been witnessing, that we've been out sharing, that we've been helping mission uh, missionaries on the mission field, that I've gone to Africa and we've been able to help some uh, people in foreign land, taking the word of God, helping them to get, helping them into better lives. Understanding that missionary Bowman is out in Nicaragua and that we support her ministry. And that's as if we are going. We need to do more for her. We need more committed people that say, look, I'm not able to go or that's not my calling, but I have a few dollars that I can give her. And see, that's showing the light because we need to reach out to folks that doesn't have as have what we have. But let's bring it back home before we go to Nicaragua. We need to make sure that folks on 85th Avenue see that we are the light. You don't have to make light shine. Light just shine. You are the light of the world. A city that sitteth on a hill cannot be hidden. Have you ever crossed the Bay Bridge at night? San Francisco just glow. When you're coming back from San Francisco to Oakland, the whole East Bay is lit up. You know that there's a city over there. He's saying we are more than a city. 
We have a message that's greater than any mayor, greater than any congressman, greater than any uh, county supervisor. We have a message of hope that is in Christ Jesus. And he's saying to us, wake up. Understand that you are light. And all you have to do is stand out there and let the glory of the Lord shine through you. Now look, the glory of the Lord can shine through you if you're not walking in obedience to the will of God. The glory of the Lord cannot shine through you if you are half-heartedly serving God. We're not talking about your salvation. We're talking about your identity. Are you light? Because the world is in darkness. Right now, we're going through a period in our, uh, 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 that we've never seen. Uh, we haven't seen worldwide, globally, as we're seeing it now. But I wonder how many people know that we are Christians. Mm. Been in the store and saw a Christian buying up all the rice. I don't know why you're buying up toilet paper, buying up all the toilet paper, buying up all the paper towels. It's as if you don't trust God to take care of our needs. But when you're a light, you understand that you must show love for others. Don't think of you and yours only. Oh, I have paper towels in my house. I got toilet tissue. I got all that stuff. But I tell you what, I didn't go to the store and hog it up. Because I thought about there's some others out there that need some toilet tissue. There's some others out there that need some rice. And you know we haven't ran out of toilet tissue? You know we still have some rice? I can go in my garage right now and pull out a bag of rice. We got some beans in the refrigerator, I mean, is it on the shelf. So what are you saying? When you are light, you don't think about just yourself. You think about others around you. And then you begin to shine and folks begin to see the love of God in you. Oh, help me. I'll get happy on you now. Church, we need to set examples in this dark time about how God can take care of you. My trust is not in man. My trust is in God. I've learned not to lean to my own understanding. God says, I've never seen the righteous forsaken all that young baby. Lord, I'm not saying we're going to have everything, but I know that God is going to meet my needs. You are the light. You are like a city sitting up on a hill. We are not to take our light and hide it under a basket. Shame to tell somebody who we are. Shame to let them know that we are a Christian. Because that's not a popular thing today. It's not popular to stand for what is right. But in standing for what is right, I don't have to beat nobody else up. Right, just stand all by itself. But I'm not going to belittle you and and, and make you think that you are nobody because you're not like us and you're not part of the body of Christ. Let me tell you what, we all are sinners and need to be saved. We all need to know that Jesus Christ is the Christ that is able to save to the uttermost. Oh, I wish I had time to tell you about it. But let me tell you, let's see what's happening now. We are the light of the world and we are not to take our light and hide it under a basket. We ought to let our light shine wherever we go. In the store. When I'm in a when I used to be in a restaurant, I didn't have no problem bowing my head and giving God praise. And I wasn't doing it so folks would say, Oh, there's a Christian over there. I did it because it was the right thing to do. And I wanted others to know you ought to be thankful for what you have on that plate. See, God is telling us we ought to be light to the world. We ought to not beat them up. 
we ought to love people where they are. Can I stop here for a moment? Because you see, you have to understand that God loved you right where you were. Let me tell you what, you were a sinner that needed to be saved. And God met you right where you were. Some of us, he pulled us out of the dope house. Some of us, he pulled us off the street. Some of us, he pulled us out of alcoholism. Some of us, he pulled us out of lying. Some of us, he pulled us out of gluttony. Some of us, he pulled us out of laziness. And brought us up to where he wanted us to be. Yes, we are like. Yes, we are salt. But please don't lose your flavoring. Don't become so much like the world that you can't make a difference. All your salvation is intact, but let me tell you what, you're fit for nothing but to be walked on. When I think about what Jesus did for us on Calvary, and we are getting ready to come together for communion. I will remember that he was the light that was hung on a cross. Why? Because he loved us. And he was willing to pay the price. How many of you know that when you study the book of Hebrews, you will find out that the animal sacrifice could not take away sin? How many of you know that on the day of atonement, what would happen is that they would bring a lamb to the temple and they would slay that lamb on the altar and the blood would run from that lamb, but they had to do it every year. Why? Because animal sacrifice could not take away your sin. What it did is atone your sin. You know what atonement means? Simply means that it took your sin and covered them over. But I want to tell you about some hope that came that was light to the world. Light came into the world, but the world loved darkness better than light. And let me tell you about the light. The light came into the world, hung on a cross for you and I. But before he hung on the cross, he did something. Because I want you to remember that year after year, the sacrifices that was offered up was a reminder to the people that they were sinning especially on the atonement sin, for the atonement for sin, under the Mosaic law. And it was good. It was great. But you read Hebrews chapter 10, and you will find out that those sacrifices could not take away the sins of the world. It could not take away your sin and my sin. It says, and simply, uh, the, the blood of bulls, the blood of goats couldn't take away their sin. But there was one that came. That's why I wanted us to celebrate today. That's why I wanted us to know who we are. Because you see, when we come to the communion table, it's you and I looking back. They, when they walked away from the offering, they knew they had to come back again because their sins had just been atoned but let me tell you what the Bible says about Jesus. And the reason why we can rejoice is that we find that in him, before he died, at the Last Supper, he did something in Luke chapter 22, verse 19. He says, do this in remembrance of me. He had taken the bread and he had broke it and he had gave thanks for it. And then he said, do this in remembrance of me. Now, under the Mosaic law, the offering was a reminder that they had sinned. But God wants to forgive us of our sin. You have to understand that what he's saying to us, he said, now, I don't want you to remember your sin because I've forgiven your sin. I came so that you might be saved. You drop down into verse 20, uh, in, in chapter 10, verse 17 of the book of Hebrews, you will find that it says that, our sins and our iniquities have been forgiven. What the blood of lambs couldn't do, what the blood of bullets couldn't do, what the blood of goats, bulls couldn't do, what the blood of goats couldn't do, Jesus did it for us on Calvary. And so I want you to look at back at Calvary and I want you to celebrate 
Well, what you want me to celebrate, Lord? I want you to celebrate that I died on the cross for you. I want you to celebrate that I took your place. I want you to celebrate what I did. Because now your sins have been forgiven. They have been taken away. Well, how I know it's been taken. The priest never could sit down. He had to work all the time that he was in the temple. But when Jesus went back to heaven, what did it say he did? He sat down. Why? Because the work was finished. He said it on the cross. It is finished. What's finished? All that the Father has called me to do. I came so that you might live. My God is an awesome God. And I tell you, I'm excited about being a child of God. And I'm tired of being a half-baked Christian. Yeah, I'm talking about your pastor. I want to shine. I want to be salt. I want to tell the truth. I want to stand on the word of God. So as we come to the communion table, I want you to think about this. Think about what happened when Jesus says, do this in remembrance of me. He said, I want you to see it as a celebration. Why is this celebration? Because what bulls, what goats, and what the lamb couldn't do, the perfect lamb of God did it. And I'm no longer weighted down with sin. Romans 8 and 1 said, and now there is no condemnation. See, I don't have to worry about judgment. Because God says there is now no condemnation in those to who love the Lord. I'm excited that he took my sins away and he nailed them on the cross. And because of that, I'm set free. He nailed your sins. And while you are looking down your nose at somebody else and thinking that you're better than they are, you better remember where you came from. Lord Jesus, may this word touch somebody's heart as it has touched mine. And I will give you the praise for all that you've done. Lord, may we as a church be a beacon of light. May we be salt for the earth. Now bless this time that we come together and partake of communion. And may we all share it in the great joy that we have in you. In Jesus' name, amen. It is time for us to come together and partake of the Lord's Supper. I know many of us are wondering about the elements. Jesus is not hung up on elements and rituals. He's looking at our heart. And he wants to know, is our heart right? Have our heart been fixed? I wish that you could see the picture that's behind me. It's one that reminds me that I am a new creation. That picture reminds me that I'm shedding that old Larry because I am not shedding it. God is shedding it. Let me correct it. Because he's the one that makes us a new creature. And if you're doing the same things that you were doing before you said that you were saved, go back and check yourself out. See if you are truly born again. 
Because there ought to be evidence that a transformation has taken place in your life by the blood of Jesus. These elements rep represent that body that was battered and hung on a tree. We've already prayed over these elements. We ask that you and your family pray over them, that you come together and that you take this with us. That bread represent the body of Jesus Christ. That body that was beaten beyond recognition and hung on a tree. That body that they pierced in the side that they ridiculed. He took it because he loved us. I want us to take the elements, whatever you have, and I want your heart to be right because that's what God is looking at. Father God, we thank you for Jesus. For Jesus, I rejoice, I shout because you became our substitute. The word of God said you died a substitutionary death. And Lord, we make that a big word, but it just means that you took our place. We thank you, Jesus, for taking our place. And Lord, may we walk in obedience to you for what you've done for us. Let us eat together. Then he took the cup. A cup represented the blood of Jesus. Jesus said, this is the new covenant that I make. We're under that disposition of grace. Grace has always been, but you and I are living under grace. And I shout and praise God that I don't have to offer up a lamb because the perfect lamb was offered up. His blood was shed. And the old song said, I can plunge beneath that blood and have all my sins washed away. Let us come and give thanks. Father, we thank you for this cup. But Jesus, it was your blood that ran down. It's your blood that was shed on our behalf. We drink this in remembrance of you. Church family, thank you for allowing me to come into your TV room, your living room, your bedroom, wherever you're watching. Thank you for being a part of our worshiping experience, and I pray that you are excited about today. If I can leave you with a couple of thoughts, the first thing is know who you are. You are a child of God. The Bible tells us as men as received him, to them gave he the power, the authority to become children of God. That's John chapter 1, verse 12. You need to read it for yourself. And it says, He that called upon him shall be saved. Know who you are. You are salt. Salt is a good thing. It has many, many virtues. But when salt has lost its season, it's saltness. It's good for nothing but to be walked on. You're the light. Be a light in a dark community. God bless you and keep you. And we ask that you continue to support us financially as we are going through these difficult times and we know that you are going through them also. We're praying that how God has blessed you, that's how we all operate as God, how God has blessed us, turn around and be a blessing to someone else. You can contribute through Cash App or PayPal, or you can go to our Cosmo site and you can donate there. Somebody said, well, I knew you was going to talk about money. Let me tell you what. God speaks about money throughout his word. And we are called to support the house of God and to take care of those that are treading out the mill. 
So we pray that you will continue to support the church. We thank you for what you've done. Continue to bless us in the way that God has blessed you. May the peace of God be with you. Be safe, stay in, do what you've been told to do. And then we are hoping that very soon we'll be able to get back together and meet and be one in Christ. It's in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit that we all said amen. God bless you and goodbye.